work. Uh, as I begin, I want to share a story. I, if you know me, uh, maybe this is not a good thing, but it is what it is. I'm not very um, empathetic. I'm, it's not a strength of mine in terms of like someone tell me something sad. I don't really know what to say or what to do. I kind of freeze up. I care, but I don't know, always know how to express it. Uh, but one thing I am is, and I, I, I like to call myself this, is I am physically empathetic. In other words, if you have something wrong with you, I feel it. Like i very uh, queasy. Uh, but not only that, like my first reaction, if you told me you broke a bone or this, I had an accident, whatever, is to tell you that you're lying because it's disgusting and I can't do it. But I also will grab the, uh, like unconsciously will grab the region of the body that you're talking about because I feel your pain. Um, in fact, in like, if it's me, it's not a big deal, but like, I, can't, I, can't, um, I can't watch a kid with a loose tooth. I can't look at that. Like, I cannot look at that. Uh, I have, we have a five-year-old daughter, two-year-old son. I have never clipped their fingernails. I don't know why, but I can't do it. And not only that, when I have to hold them down, especially when they're younger, and Christina's, I can't even, I'm like looking away as far as I can. <laughs> I can't do it. Uh, when people crack their knuckles... I, I want to vomit. Like, people are like, this gross. Christina has this lovely habit in the middle of the night, every night, two to three times a night, she'll just start cracking her fingers away. I don't want to throw up, like, in the, in the bed. Like, I can't do it, right? So, so, so physically, if something's wrong with you, you will get me to move very easily. Just tell me something that happened to you, and I'll be like, ugh, and I'll, and I'll move. Now, I share that story because this morning we're looking at this question. What does it take for God to move? Uh, as we look at this idea of, um, you know, what is, what is our role? What does it look like for us to ask God to move? What is it our role to be a part of God's mission? And how can we play a part in what God is wanting to do or is doing? What does it look like for us to, to ask God and to, to do certain things that God might move with us and on our behalf? That's what we're looking at this morning. And so uh, if you have a Bible, uh, we are in Revelation chapter 3. Um, you can follow along. The, the verses will be on the screen uh, for the next However, however long, uh, but also if you want to have a Bible yourself or if you want to follow along in the black Bibles below the seat, um, that's the page number it can be on. If you haven't been with us, following us online, we are in the book of Revelation. No, this was not uh, chosen because we think the world's ending because of the pandemic. It just happened to be already planned. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, we're just looking at chapter 2 and 3, so the book of Revelation, if you're not quite familiar with it, you might know it's really confusing, uh, but it was written to the seven churches uh, and what is now modern day Western Turkey. And so there's a lot of like end time craziness and confusion. But at chapter two and three, uh, John, is Jesus' revelation to John, is specifically talking to the seven churches about things that have to do with what they're experiencing in their present first century context. And so we're reading and kind of learning uh, with them. And so uh, today we're in uh, chapter three, starting in verse seven. This is uh, the church of Philadelphia. To give you some context behind what's happening here, uh, Philadelphia was called the gateway to the east. Uh, it was not a port city, but there was a, a couple of major highways and roads that traveled through the city. So there was a lot of trade and commerce there. Uh, leather, textile businesses, and wine was kind of their big thing. Uh, it was located in a vo- volcanic region, which made the soil really well, really good for wine and grape harvest. Uh, the downside is there was a lot of earthquakes. Uh, we know in AD 17, there was such a big earthquake that they experienced aftershocks for the next 20 years. Uh, and then lastly, just like all the regions and the cities and towns in the Roman Empire at this time, uh, they've served, they worship various deities and gods. The god of Dionysus was the big god uh, in Philadelphia because he was worshiped to ensure a productive grape and wine harvest. Now, the problem that we're going to see here is that Jewish believers, that is those who were ethnically and grew up Jewish and started to follow the Messiah, were facing excommunication and really uh, ostracization from their friends and family for rejecting what is kind of, if we want to put it in modern terms, maybe the traditional Jewish faith to follow Jesus. So they're facing excommunication. And then non-Jews, Gentiles, those who weren't Jewish that had started to follow Jesus, uh, were being kind of branded as traitors. And again, what this looks like for them is in the first century context, religious life was tied into everything that they did. And so they would have grown up and be a part of different things. And every festival and gathering, you would have sacrifices to gods. And they started to follow Jesus. They said, no, we can't participate in that. And so their friends and family would also look at them as kind of uh, traitors to the Roman Empire. Why are you not taking part in what you're doing? And so Jew or Gentile following Jesus, while it was not in this region, was not maybe physical persecution or jailing. It was ostracization and social shame. That's what they were experiencing. And so here's what it says. It's Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. It says this, Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and encloses, and who closes and no one opens. 
And so again, he's right to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. It's this idea. Basically, he's saying, tell this to the spirit of the church or to the believers in Philadelphia that this is coming from the holy and true one. In their context, this would have been understood as like completely reliable. So what is about to be said to you is true and is reliable. Now, uh, basically, the context here is that whatever the Messiah says will happen, that Jesus, what he wills, will come to pass. So when it says the key of David, uh, what it's talking about here is talking about when he says when he opens and no one will close. It's a little confusing. Uh, Likely he he could be talking about Jews who were excluded from synagogues because they were no longer allowed to worship uh, with their Jewish uh, friends and family. Or it could be talking about that when Christ comes, nobody can close the door. Or it could be maybe the admission to the city of David, which is the new Jerusalem. What's likely happening here, I know it's a little bit confusing. What's likely happening here, it seems most likely, that he's saying that when Jesus moves, when the gospel is going forth, nobody can, again, they're, they're experiencing excommunication and ostracization. When the gospel is moving forward, nobody can shut the door for those who trust and follow. And Jesus, what's likely probably happening there, that even though they're small in number, their faithfulness has made it possible for people still to experience who Jesus is. Verse 7, he then says, or verse 8, he then says this. He says, I know your works. Look, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Again, it's a little confusing what he means by open door that no one can close. Uh, He could be talking about maybe a missionary or evangelistic opportunity. Uh, He could be talking about access to Christ, but given verse 7 and 8, again, the context likely is saying here is entrance into God's kingdom. That even though that they're small in number, their faithfulness is making it possible no matter what people may be experiencing or facing, to experience Jesus and be welcomed into his kingdom. It says they have little power, but they kept his word. Again, the church was materially poor. Now, uh, most of the people in that time period were, didn't, have, didn't have very much money. But again, it was probably even worse for those that were following Jesus because they were going to ostracize and excluded from various things in their community, which would have also had a uh, financial impact as well. They're materially poor, and yet they are spiritually Rich, rich. What's happening here is that they're holding on to Christ despite difficulties that they are facing. Or facing their faithfulness has left the door open. And as we read this, what what, what I think Paul is getting at, especially with this question um, of what does it look like uh, to to be a part of what God is doing and seeing God move. Here's what we see: that God moves based on the quality of faith, not the quantity. God moves based on the quality of our faith, not the quantity. In other words, it's not about God needing tons and numerous amount of people to do something. What he needs is people who love him, love people, and are willing to uh, do whatever God asks of him. And we see this, this theme all throughout Scripture. I'll give you a couple examples. You may be familiar with some of these. Some of these you may not be as familiar with. But in the Old Testament, there's a story of Gideon who's leading the Israel to war. And he's got all of these people. And God essentially whittles his army down to 300 uh, soldiers only because he wants to show Israel that it's not them and their power and their might that saves and rescues. It's God. And so he whittles it down to 300. They end up winning. Why? To show that God is looking for faithful people, not a lot of people who may or may not be following him. He doesn't need us. He welcomes us into what he's doing. And so it's, it's, he moves on the quality of our faith, not the quantity. There's also the story of Elijah the prophet, who was basically uh, being persecuted. There was not, uh, Israel was very unfaithful at this time. And so he goes up against 450 prophets of Baal, which was a false god uh, that many of the surrounding neighboring communities, and even Israel, was worshiping at that time. Uh, they were facing a massive drought, and they built two altars, and the false prophets to Baal were going to call down to their gods from heaven to strike a fire onto the altar. And then Elijah was going to call to the one true God. And so the, the 450 prophets go first. They're beating themselves. They're doing all these things. Nothing happens. And then Elijah shows up. It's his turn. He takes a massive quantities of water, which was a big deal because they were in a drought, and pours it all over his altar, which if you've ever tried to make a fire, wet wood is pretty much impossible. I can't make a fire with dry wood, so I don't even know. You know this is a miracle, right? He calls down from heaven, and God makes a fire onto the altar. He's not looking for numerous of people. He's looking for people who are faithful. We see this in the New Testament, right? Jesus had a handful of followers, handful of followers, and not just maybe his 12 disciples, but maybe somewhere around 70 men and women who were faithfully following him throughout his earthly ministry, and God used those men and women 
to do what you and I are doing now, sitting here worshiping Jesus, not because he needed a lot of people, he needed a faithful few who would love and follow him. Lastly, I'll give you one more example. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus is outside the temple, and he's seeing people giving to the temple out of their riches, right? So maybe these people felt good, some of the religious leaders, but they were giving out of their excess. They weren't being sacrificial. It's maybe the end of the month, and their their budget was looking good, and so they gave a little bit more because they could. And then this widow shows up with nothing, uh, drops two coins into the offering, and Jesus says, this person is not giving out of their excess. They're giving all that they have, right? He, He says, I'm going to use this. It's based off our quality, not the quantity of faith. And so that, that leaves us here today as we face the difficulties, the pandemic, maybe the racial injustices, all the things that you may be personally experiencing in your life. And what this means for us is that God is not looking for everybody in the world to, to follow him in order for him to move. But he is looking for a faithful few who might be willing to say, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to trust you. And so to that end, one of the things I know maybe various people have been uh, following along with us online over these last couple of months, one of the things we started a few weeks ago was uh, fasting uh, fasting and praying through breakfast and lunch on Tuesdays, if you're able to do that. Uh, And we're talking about food, like actually being hungry. And we're going before God weekly, breakfast and lunch, asking God to move with the coronavirus uh, things that are going on, with the racial injustices that are being brought to light, with the economic impact or anything that you have been, are experiencing, uh, asking God for a repentance of sin and to holiness or people that you know in your life that need God to move, this is one of the ways that we do that, that we, that we develop uh, regular rhythms in our life to turn our heart to Jesus so that we might be some of these people who have a quality of faith that God uses, regardless of what you look like, how much money you have, what you have done, how much influence or power, none of that matters. Jesus is looking for the quality of our faith not the quantity to do something. The church in Philadelphia was materially poor and small, but God was using them in mighty ways because the quality of their faith was strong. So with that, he continues verse 9 by saying this. He says, Note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying, I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. Again, as we've seen these last couple of weeks, first century Christians actually referred to themselves as Jews. Uh, They kind of saw it as they were uh, continuing the Jewish tradition uh, tradition that that saw its culmination in Jesus. So they would refer to themselves as Jews. And of course, again, if you want to say maybe the traditional Jews would say, well, no, because you're not doing all these things that that we're doing and we don't believe in this Messiah Jesus like you do. And so there was this kind of uh, argument over who was actually truly Jewish. And so there was this argument uh, there. And so again, the traditional Jews would say you're not Jewish. And then the Jewish believers would say we actually are because we're we're seeing the culmination in Jesus. And what, what is happening here is that Jesus through John is saying that ultimately everyone will see and acknowledge who Christ is, that he actually is Lord and will bow down to him. Some will be out of uh, uh, gratefulness and thankfulness for what Christ has done, and some will be out of our 